Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. So, so this session, <clears throat> this session is. How to read a book. Now, this is just an extension of uh, how to read articles and all which I discussed with you in preview and all. So this is just an extension of that, but yeah, there are many more things to do. Uh, now, uh, so the first thing you have to remember is that when you approach a book, there are two ways of approaching a book in the sense that by approach I mean uh, when you get introduced to a book like you come across it for the first time so there are two things the first is that you come across it in a in a store in a book store and the second is that uh, and by book store by that I mean you come across it by random browsing okay so uh, in science there is something known as serendipitous discovery. So serendipity has to do with uh, chance, but good chance, favorable chance. So serendipity has a lot of role. X-ray is uh, a result of serendipity. Uh, and um, I think even radium is a, is a result of serendipity and so on. Uh, so, uh, so I mean to say serendipitous dis discovery of a book in a bookstore, meaning uh, you are generally browsing. So, if you like bookstores, like I do, uh, unfortunately, bookstores uh, are dying, have died because of idiotic things like Amazon, which has some good things, but yeah, the bookstores it has eaten up bookstores worldwide, which is a very very sad thing. Uh, visiting a bookstore and spending hours there was one of the most favorite things of mine, but uh, I can't do it. And Pune, where I stay these days, is is really bad at it. Uh, I don't know, uh, not not many bookstores, and the ones which are there are bookstores like Crossword, and I don't like Crossword. It only has the you know the popular stuff, uh, not not very good. Uh, Delhi, where I used to be, uh, ha uh, contrary to what people think of Delhi, Delhi has a very uh, rich culture uh, in a lot of respects, and so there, there were very amazing books so some of them have again for the same reasons have died down but a few still remain very very good bookstores i think uh, the capital of bookstores in india should be calcutta but i've never seen that so i don't know so anyway in a bookstore you generally browsing or you went to buy some other book and you're just browsing because you know it is nice to see so many books and you sort of uh, you come across a book that you would want to read so this is one thing so remember in a bookstore i mean to say and the accidental discovery of a book and the other is that somebody told you about this so you uh, you know about the book that and know because either you read a review of it or your friend recommended it or something like that and so either you go to a bookstore or you go to an online store and you just want to buy that book so uh, so these are two ways of uh, figuring out a book uh, either way in in both these cases i think the first thing you have to do is uh, the purpose of reading this book, so meaning basically, uh, why do I want to read this book? Now, this is a very important question, guys. Okay. This is extremely important, uh, and, and with respect to today's class, okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, okay, magnetism, maybe, uh, sure. I'm not aware. So, anyway, so, uh, with respect to today's class, this is a very important question, you know, and it will become relevant in some time. So, why do I want to read this book? Meaning, what do I want to get out of it? Because when you know the answer to this question, you will be able to do what I'm going to tell you in a much better way, in a more effective and efficient way, and you will get much more out of it, what I'm going to tell you. Okay, so, so this is the first question. So what happens in a bookstore, uh, 
it can happen in an online store also, but of course the mechanism will be different. But what happens in a bookstore is uh, you usually what happens is either you li like the cover of a book or you like the title of a book or you like the look of a book. I don't know what happens. And so suppose you like uh, the title of a book. Okay. So I'll pick up from here. So suppose, suppose uh, you, you are um, browsing a bookstore and you either see uh, that the book is kept like this, so you, either you see it, okay, and you like the picture, you know, there is the, so there is a rabbit, a dog, a girl with a bag and you know, she's sort of walking and then you read the title on looking. And so you, you realize, okay, so this girl is looking, maybe it has to do with that. And it seems like a novel, like it seems like it is a fiction book, you know. Uh, so the first thing you need to do in a bookstore is you need to turn the page. If it is a paperback, if it is a paperback, you need to turn the page. If it is... If it is a hardcover, meaning it's not a paperback, it is hardbound. So it is known as either a hardbound book or a or a paper or, or a hardcover or a hardbound. So again, suppose you like this book. Uh, I mean, this is a title that a lot of people will be attracted by. A, a guide to a good life, you know, and so on. Uh, so you may. Uh, so, so then, what happens in? So I'll tell you in each case. Remember, the class has begun. Okay, guys. Shubhangini, but I showed on the camera. Was that okay? Was that okay, Shubhangini? I share. I showed the book. Oh, I think the 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 this because maybe the I'll stop sharing so that the screen is bigger. I'll come back to the screen later. Okay, so I think now probably the screen will be bigger. Is the screen bigger, guys? Okay, so I think now you'll be able to see it properly. So, so this is the first book, you know, you see the picture, you like it on looking. And then you think, hmm, it seems like a novel, seems like a storybook. So you're immediately supposed to turn it around. And then you're supposed to read it. So I'll read it for you. Um, now, he, here's an important thing. You, you're supposed to ignore the reviews unless there is a reviewer you know about and you think that that reviewer is worth listening to. Otherwise, you're supposed to ignore because by definition, uh, it's an advertisement. Okay, So you're supposed to ignore. So for example, somebody called Susan Olin has written a review and similarly here. So you're supposed to ignore that. What you're supposed to read is there is going to be a description of the book. Okay, so I'll read the description. Alexandra Horowitz, so who is the author author of this book? So Alexandra Horowitz, brilliant on looking. Eleven walks with expert eyes. This is a subtitle, and probably you read it. Eleven, eleven walks with expert eyes. So. Um, Alexandra Horowitz's brilliant onlooking 11 walks with expert eyes shows us how to see the spectacle of the ordinary. Okay. So now we suddenly realize hmm, this is not a fiction book, it's, it's a non fiction book. Uh, 11 walks with expert eyes shows us how to see the spectacle of the ordinary, meaning every day. To practice, as Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle the author of Sherlock Holmes. So, as Sir Arthur, to practice, as Sir Arthur Conan Doyle puts it, the observation of trifles. Trifles comes from trifling. Trifling means something which is unimportant, small, unnecessary. That's a trifle, okay? So, 
the observation of trifles so now compare it with the previous word ordinary so observation of the ordinary or the trifles on looking this is the title of the book on looking is structured around a series of 11 walks come back to the subtitle 11 walks with expertise it's structured around a series of 11 walks the author takes with experts on a diverse range of subjects. Oh, now we have totally understood the title and the subtitle. On looking 11 walks with expertise. And these expert eyes, it's not the author, it's experts. Experts of what? On a diverse range of subjects, including an urban sociologist, urban sociologist, an artist, second. Remember, there are going to be 11 a geologist, a physician, and a sound designer, including, so just mentioned a few of the 11. So she, urban sociologist, artist, geologist, physician, and a sound designer. She also walks with a child and a dog to see the world. She also walks with a child. So one more. And a dog. So this is the picture. She also walks with a child and a dog to see the world as they perceive it. Children and animals maybe. What they see, how they see it, and why most of us do not see the same things reveal the startling power of human attention. So what some people see or some other things like children or maybe animals see how it is different from what we see and what does it show the startling startling is surprising in a very positive sense the startling power of human attention where different types of people pay attention you know i will pay attention somewhere else somebody somewhere else as the million plus readers of inside a dog have discovered and inside a dog is in italics so which means it's probably another book by the same author. As the million plus readers of Insider Dog have discovered, Alexandra Horowitz is charmingly adept, adept is skilled, charmingly adept at explaining the mysteries of human perception. So she's very good at explaining the mysteries of human perception. Remember, connected with attention. So she's good at writing about these things. On looking, again, the title of the book confirms her place as one of today's most illuminating observers, illuminating something which throws light. So as one of today's most illuminating observers of our infinitely complex world. So I think more or less we have understood what kind of a book this is. She's going to walk with 11 experts, so maybe nine experts, and 10th is going to be a child and 11th is going to be a dog. We don't know the order. But that is how it is going to be. And she's going to write what they see. So, you know, for example, when, a, when an artist walks the same place, like same, so let's say there is a street. Think of a street in your town, you know, like a market street or something. And when you walk with an artist or a historian or a scientist and you just ask that person to keep speaking whatever that person is observing and you keep making notes, that's what she has done. So, uh, you know, at least I will become curious. I will want to know, you know. It's, uh, so, it's, uh, so this is what you're supposed to do in a paperback. In a hardbound, what will happen is usually hardbound book behind, there won't be anything. There will just be those reviews, as I said. So, you have to obviously ignore. In a hardbound book, more often than not, sometimes it is here, but very rare, more often than not, that same thing. This is known as a blurb. You can call it a publisher's blurb. So this is known as a blurb. So the blurb is going to be in the inside front cover here. And the outside front cover, the last, is going to be about the author. So this is what this is going to be. So let's do it for this one also. A Guide to a Good Life, it is called. It is written by William B. Irvine. Guide to a Good Life sounds interesting or at least uh, everybody wants a good life and so on. Okay, so let's read. One of the great fears many of us face is that, one of the great fears that many of us face is that despite all our effort and striving, no matter how much effort we put or how much we strive, you know, go after things, we will discover at the end that we have wasted our life. This is one of the fears that each one of us lives with. Is it true? I think, I think it is absolutely true. It, 
I don't know, unless someone is living in a dream world, you know, not bothered every day, nonsense, but anybody who thinks even a little bit uh, thinks on these lines. So despite all our effort and striving, we will discover at the end that we have wasted at the end, meaning on a deathbed. In a guide to a good life, this is the title of the book, <clears throat> William B. Irvine, the author, plums the vis wisdom of stoic philosophy. Now, stoic philosophy, even if you don't know, it doesn't matter because you know, you're just getting introduced for the first time. But I think I discussed stoic philosophy in one of the earlier classes. So stoics, uh, stoic philosophy in a nutshell is very similar to Buddhist philosophy. You know, their basic deal is that pay, uh, uh, you should pay attention or rather be concerned with things you, which are in your control, which you can change. And you shouldn't bother too much about things which are not in your control. That is the basic in a one sentence summary of Stoic philosophy. Okay, So he plums the wisdom of Stoic philosophy, one of the most popular and successful schools of thought in ancient Rome. Okay, Technically, Stoic philosophy came from Greece, but a lot of their works were lost and uh, it was revived in Rome, okay? Uh, and shows how its insight, its insights means Stoic philosophy's insight and advice are still remarkably applicable, applicable to modern life. Which means Stoic philosophy, even though it's an ancient philosophy, its teachings are still relevant for us, even in modern life. In a guide to the good life, Irvine offers a refreshing presentation of Stoicism, refreshing meaning in a new way, showing how this ancient philosophy can still direct us toward a better life. Using the psychological insights and the practical techniques of the Stoics, so it's not just theoretical, it's practical also, so psychological as well as practical insights, and of the Stoics, Irvine offers a roadmap, meaning a way, a route. He offers a roadmap for anyone seeking to avoid the feelings, anyone seeking to avoid the feelings, meaning anybody who doesn't want something which is going to come. Avoid the feelings of chronic, dis, chronic dissatisfaction, meaning chronic is the opposite of acute. So it is used for illness. Acute illness, whatever illness is, uh, sharp but short-lived. Chronic is long-lived. It has actually started harming you. Chronic dissatisfaction that plagues so many of us. Most of us are dissatisfied. I, I don't think there is a bigger truth than dissatisfaction. Most of the hurry, the, the madness that you're seeing in the world is because of dissatisfaction. Being dissatisfied with wherever you are today in your life. You have you may be having a, a Honda City car, but you are dissatisfied because it is not what your neighbor has, which is an, um, I don't know, an, an Octavia. And the Octavia guy is pissed off because uh, his uh, friend has just now bought a BMW, you know, and so on and so forth. So chronic dissatisfaction that plagues so many, because Stoic philosophy, through Stoic philosophy, this book is going to tell us how to get rid of this nonsense. Irvine looks at various stoic techniques, techniques for attaining tranquility, peace of mind, calmness, and shows how to put these techniques to work in our own lives. As he does so, he describes his own experiences practicing stoicism. Of course, he, you know, uh, we will only trust him if he himself has tried it. So his own experiences practicing stoicism and offers valuable first-hand advice for anyone wishing to live better by following the footsteps of these ancient philosophers. Makes sense. We learn how to minimize worry, minimize worry. We learn how to do that. How to let go of the past, how to forget the past and focus on the things we can control. This is what I've told you. And how to deal with, how to deal with, pay attention, insults, grief, which is sadness, old age, and the distracting temptations of fame and fortune. How to deal with these things. Insults, when somebody has insulted you. Sadness, grief, old age. A lot of people are scared of old age. And the distracting temptations of fame and fortune. We learn from Marcus Aurelius, the importance of Marcus Aurelius is one of the Stoics, ancient Stoics. We learn from Marcus Aurelius, the importance of pricing. Now in this case, it has carried on to the backside. 
So we learn from Marcus Aurelius the importance of pricing, pricing meaning giving importance to only things of true value. So we learn how we should value only the things which have true value. And from Epictetus, Epictetus is another one of the Roman Stoics. From Epictetus, we learn how to be more content with what we have. So we learn from Epictetus that whatever we have, how to be satisfied with what we have. Finally, a guide to good life shows us how to become thoughtful observers of our own lives. You know, am I living well? If we watch ourselves, if we watch ourselves as we go about our daily business and later reflect on what we saw, which means throughout the day we paid attention to what we were doing, saying, thinking, and at night or whenever we think about those things, we can better identify the sources of distress and eventually avoid that pain. So once we start observing these things and reflect on them, we can figure out what is it that makes us feel sad, angry, all that. And therefore we will be able to avoid it. By doing this, the Stoics thought we can hope to attain a truly joyful life. Now, what, what has happened guys, what has happened by uh, reading these publishers blurb, so let's call it blurb. What has happened by reading these two blurbs? We have got a decent summary of the book, what the book is about. And once we do that, So, once we read the summary and whatever, this question, first of all, becomes relevant with respect to that book and the answer becomes relevant. Okay, after reading this, do I, first of all, do I want to read this? Either one of them or both of them, do I want to read? And if so, why? Why should I read uh, this book, you know? So, because I want to know ABCD, because I want to know EFGH or whatever. One second, guys, uh, the chat has gone away. Yeah. So, so, why do I want to read this book while standing in a bookstore or, you know, whatever? Because this will help me, as I said, do what I'm going to tell you in a much more effective way. Now let's do the real thing with, with a book. So for that, I have put a book here. Um, okay. So I think I shared this book with you guys, probably I'm not sure. Uh, so this is called Marks A Very Short Introduction. Okay. Uh, I just uh, saw it lying around and I thought I'll do it with this. Also because there are a few things which are conducive, meaning they are they cater to precisely what I want to do. So uh, there are a few things which are conducive to our purpose here because of the medium, you know, because uh, you don't have the book in front. And so uh, there are things I have to do. So I didn't want things to be long. And thankfully, everything here that I want to discuss uh, is short. Okay, so that is the, that is the thing. So... So this is the actual book, okay, uh, Mark's a very short introduction. And uh, this is, even though it's a paperback, it is made like a hard bound wherein there is this thing. So chances are something will be here. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think it is written here anywhere. So I'll have to read that for you. So I've come across this book and then I start, and then I read the publisher's blurb. So let's do that. Peter Singer, some people pronounce his name as Singer, some as uh, Singer. Uh, so he's a, he's a very, very popular uh, philosopher, okay? Uh, he's one of the finest uh, today. Uh, so so he, uh, he's primarily known for animal rights. Like, I think in the 60s or maybe the 70s, 1960s or 1970s, uh, he wrote a book, I think, called Animal Rights or something. And after which, uh, the whole animal rights movement came into the picture. And because of him, uh, there are thousands and thousands of people, especially philosophers, 
uh, who became vegetarians, you know, because of him. So he's, he's very widely known. And he's right now a professor of bioethics at Princeton University. Okay, uh, sorry, he's, his best known, he's best known for his book, Animal Liberation, uh, sometimes called the Bible of the Modern Animal Movement. Uh, so anyway, uh, so, uh, so Peter Singer has succeeded in identifying the central vision that unifies Marxist thought. You know, one thing about Marx is it's very difficult to understand because he wrote so much and such diverse stuff that it's very difficult. So he has, uh, so this book uh, sort of in, in so many pages, uh, which is impossible, but then he's tried his best and it seems he has been successful in unifying Marxist thought. He thus makes it possible in remarkably few pages, obviously, for us to grasp Marx's views as a whole. So, you know, uh, in case you were confused, so for example, in the bookstore, Marx, very short introduction, and you have, I'm sure everybody has heard of Marx, you know, it seems, um, Marx's name comes after Jesus, I think, or Bible in terms of popularity. So I think you know that Christians are the most in the world, the number one religion in terms of population is Christianity. And so, uh, so obviously Jesus will be the most uh, uttered name. And it seems Marx is the second. So everybody has heard of him, but most people don't know. And if you look, if you uh, infer what Marx is about or was about from media, uh, especially the mainstream media, you will get completely distorted picture. And so you might be curious, you know, what the hell is up with Marx? You know, why was he or still is such a big deal? You know, what's the thing? I keep reading that he was stupid or whether his philosophy was stupid. This happened, that happened. Then how comes uh, something so stupid became so big that, you know, Marx is so popular or whatever. So that may be the curiosity to pick this book. So in remarkably few pages for us to grasp Marx's views as a whole, rather than as an economist or as a social scientist. So not just as an economist, not just as a social scientist, but as a whole, his view. He explains, he meaning a singer, explains alienation, historical materialism, you may not understand these things, the economic theory of capital and Marx's ideas of communism. Communism is something that will immediately hit you. Yeah, yeah, Marx is synonymous with communism. And uh, in plain English and concludes with an assess. So I'll read it again. He explains alienation. So remember these words. Uh, uh, keeping in mind that probably we can't understand them. Alienation, we can understand the basic thing, you know, like alienate somebody to make alien, to move away from something. But we don't know in this context if it means the same thing. So he explains alienation, historical materialism, the economic theory of capital, and Marx's ideas of communism in plain English. This is what this book does. And concludes with an assessment of Marx's legacy, meaning what now? Uh, what has Marx left us with? So this is what this book is about. And you may feel, hmm, that makes sense. I think I want to read this book. All right, cool. So now what is the next thing you're supposed to do? Here is the next thing you're supposed to do. You're supposed to, oops, I have to do it here. I'm sorry. You're supposed to immediately go do one of these two things. Guys, can you see this or should I do like this? So just tell me landscape or portrait. Which one do you want? Landscape or portrait? Others? Because I just, I just want you to be able to read it properly, okay? All right, so when I have to read something in detail, I'll do it landscape, but for now I'll keep it portrait. Cool, guys. Now, so what happens, you will find, as you just turn a few pages, you will find either the preface or you will find something called introduction. I'm talking about nonfiction. Guys, by the way, this class is only for nonfiction. There is nothing known as 
uh, how to read a book in terms of uh, 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 fiction because then you will mess it up. I mean, think about it, a murder mystery and you are browsing the book and all that. So um, it, this thing only applies to, uh, to, to non-fiction. Okay, so, okay so, so keep this in mind. It, it only applies to non-fiction. So uh, you will either find one of these. Uh, so either you will find um, preface or you will find introduction. Sometimes you will find both of them. So in which case introduction is the real thing. So you are supposed to read either the, if it's their only preface than that, only introduction than that, if both of them, then most probably you'll have to read introduction. You can browse and figure out which one is actually summarizing. So because usually that will act as a detailed summary of the book by the author rather than the blurb, which could have been written by the publisher, you know, so, uh, and, and the blurb will have only the good things, but the author will talk about the book uh, in detail. And so, so, as I said, I chose this book because, you know, usually, uh, so I was trying to browse which book to bring here and uh, the introduction itself was so long. I was like, uh, I mean, I can just skip it, but then I wanted a full thing. So here uh, it, it's only this much. Okay. So, so that is the beauty of it. So we can read it together, you know, so introduction preface, that is the first thing to read. Why to read that? Because it is, it will give us what the book is about. So remember, that's a very important uh, thing, uh, what the book is about. Okay, let's read this together. There are many books on Marx, but a good brief introduction, this is an important word, short. Introduction to his thought is still hard to find, which is obvious, I mean, Marx wrote so much and his, uh, the most popular work of his is the Communist Manifesto, which is not too uh, long, but uh, there is a book called Das Capital, you may have heard of it, The Capital, that is so thick and probably it comes in a couple of volumes and also, uh, how can you introduce it, it's very difficult, so, uh, but we can now, uh, you remember, uh, art of uh, prediction, so we can predict then that this guy is trying to do that, Singer is probably going to take care of this hard to find thing, you know, uh, that a good brief introduction to his thought is still hard to find. Marx wrote at such enormous length, so this is what I just now said, and on so many different subjects that it is not easy to see his ideas as a whole, of course, you know. I believe that there is a central idea. Okay, so the author thinks that even though it is so disparate, meaning such different kinds of things, the author still thinks there is a unification theme running across Marx's works. So I believe that there is a central idea, a vision of the world which unifies all of Marx's thought, all of. So this is Peter Singer's belief. Uh, there could be philosophers who disagree with this guy. You could be one of them who eventually disagree, but Peter Singer thinks no. There is something which is common to everything that Marx has written. So uh, all of Marx's thought and explains what would otherwise be puzzling features of it. Okay, so it obviously it could be puzzling. In this book, I try to say in terms comprehensible, meaning understandable, to those with little or no previous knowledge of Marx's writing. So I think I'm assuming this guy, so I apologize in case I'm wrong for one or two of you, but this is precisely for, let's call it us, for you and you know, whatever. If we don't know anything, we, we, we know from not even secondary, third, tertiary, fourth, fifth sources. And we know from, we know about marks from journalists. Journalists are not some of the people to be trusted. Okay, so in terms comprehensible to those with little or no previous knowledge of Marx's writing. So then you might think, hmm. And remember, you're doing this in a bookstore, guys. Okay, this is what you should do before buying a book. And if you're not in a bookstore, thankfully, Amazon, uh, for most of their books, they give a preview. So usually preface and all that is there in the preview. Uh, so with little or no previous knowledge of Marx's writings, what this central vision is. So this is what Singer is going to do that to beginners with respect to Marx, Singer is going to tell us what Marx was about, what was the central theme of his thoughts. If I have succeeded, I need no further 
excuse for having added yet another book to the already abundant literature on Marx and Marxism. So he's saying, if I succeed in this, I don't know, I need no excuse that how come one more book on Marx? Why? Because I'm doing something completely different. Okay. So this is the only introduction here. For biographical details of Marx's life, I'm especially indebted to this, 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 and so on. So not particularly. In. And the last is, in the interest of clear prose, prose is the opposite of poetry, so prose is non-fiction writing. In the interest of clear prose, I have occasionally made minor amendments, meaning changes, to the translations of Marx's works from which I have quoted. Okay, so, so as to be clear to a beginner, when so Marx wrote in German, okay, so uh, his works can only be read in translation. So uh, whenever Singer is quoting from those translations, sometimes he has made minor changes so that a beginner finds it easier to understand. Okay, so this is so he's just qualifying uh, something initially. So so we know what this book is about. We know most uh, mostly what is going to happen in this book and therefore the question why should i read this book now can be answered in a better way so suppose now you decide to read this book now guys now here's the thing what i'm going to tell you applies like it's it's easier and much better if you have a book in your hand rather than an ebook on your computer or kindle computer will still be fine because browsing is easier but Kindle and all, it'll be, it won't be impossible, but it'll be more difficult than if you have in your hands. But whatever, we'll do it in an ebook format, okay, right now, because that's the only way I can show it to you. All right, so, so the first, first thing, what is this book about, which will, which is what the preface or the introduction will give me, and something I've already found out based on based on the blurb so these things have helped me broadly speaking what the book is about cool now what i should do and and we will have to go back in a book we will now go to the table of contents okay so remember it will always almost always happen that the table of contents will be before the introduction or whatever but we won't read it before first we will read the blurb second we will read the preface or introduction only then will we go to the table of contents. Now, why will we go to the table of contents? Because in a non-fiction work, a table of content tells me the chapter headings. And more often than not, the chapter headings, you can look at them as titles of those chapters. And you know from your reading of magazines, newspapers, articles, internet, the titles, if written properly, nicely, can be of great help in understanding what is uh, what is uh, that thing about you know so uh, it's it's a very nice way to figure out so a book is divided into chapters a non-fiction book what is it that each chapter is about is what table of contents will tell me so let's read it the first chapter is life a life and its impact so we know very easily that this is going to be a sort of a brief, remember this is a, anyway a short book. So it is going to be a short biography of, you know, his many early years, born, brought up, something on those lines. And what impact did it have later on? The young Hegelian, you probably will not understand this. I will, but we will, we will assume you won't understand. So we will just keep this. From God to money, this sounds interesting. Hmm, I will keep this. So if I have a book with me, I will do this. Uh, which, uh, sorry, here I will do this. And here, what I will do is, I will probably do this, which means any sign, it's up to you, which means uh, I will come back to this. And, and come back to this for this preview stage, not while reading the book. For this preview state okay enter the proletariat you you may have heard this term with respect to marx or with respect to communism or whatever you may or may not know the meaning of this word again uh, so you don't know probably 
the first Marxism, so early years, okay? So this is okay, this is understandable. Alienation, remember in the, in the blurb we read that the, uh, Singer is going to tell us about alienation and ABCD. So alienation, hmm, that, that's interesting. Okay, I'll keep this as a question mark and like this also that maybe I will come back to this. Just, just stay with me, okay? The goal of history, okay? This sounds interesting. Economics, Marx and economics, of course. So, and then communism. Well, uh, obviously, if you don't use the term communism with Marx, then you, then you can't do anything. Assessment. This is, if you remember the introduction and the blog, this is what Sinja says, I will try to do. I will eventually bring it all together and you know tell you what uh, and and what legacy has Marx left us with so this chapter is going to do that fine so I have got roughly how the book is structured how the book is divided it is going to start with sort of a biography then it is going to go to something which I don't uh, know then it is going to from God to money hmm, that's interesting and remember I said that I will come back to it so I will keep this in mind uh, First Marxism. Now, I can do one of the two things here. What you're supposed to do when you're, when you're uh, reading the table of contents is whenever you're curious about something and you want to know it right now. You know, so for example, you may not want to know about this, but you may want to know about this. Uh, so then you can immediately go and do a preview of that chapter uh, and remember the, the previewing technique so if but, but if the chapter is long you don't have to preview it exactly like that what you do is you just read fully the first and the last paragraph so so the, i said you can do one of the two things either you can do this immediately or you can do this after the next step the next step i'll tell you so one of the two as of now i will choose to do this after the next step okay but you could have immediately gone there and figured out any one of these chapters or more than one you just because of curiosity just because hmm, i want to know more you can go and read the first and last paragraphs to get a rough idea uh, and more often than not in a non-fiction work they will give you an idea because non-fiction authors write so as to be understood this is the case in eight out of ten cases they write to be understood, they write so that it is clear. So they follow certain good rules of writing. And one of the best rules of writing uh, for a readers, from a reader's point of view is that uh, you should start with an introduction and you should end with a summary or conclusion of whatever you have spoken. So yeah, anyway, so you can either do that or you can do what I'm going to do, which is the next step, which is we go to something called index. Now this is what brings me to a discussion, guys. There is a difference between table of contents. So, so this is contents. It is also known as table of contents. So there is a difference between table of contents and index. There are people who use these terms interchangeably. It is completely wrong. This is not known. This is not an index, guys. This is table of contents or contents. Okay. Index is in a nonfiction book and most nonfiction books. Uh, very stupidly these days some non-fiction books don't have it highly idiotic uh, but most have thankfully index is towards the end of the book so let's go there yeah so index is this most non-fiction books will have this and which is alphabetically arranged most important terms and names in a book in that book and their page numbers wherever they have been mentioned in the book that's an index okay so keep this in mind there's a difference between index and table of contents okay now here's the thing why should i read why should i go and browse through the index well Pay attention, just be with me, okay? So let's start with A. The very first word is alienation. 
remember alienation we have come across thrice already we know it is a major theme of this book and now look at the references this tells us that all of these pages talk about alienation which means from 18 till 36 which means 18 19 20 21 22 and so on okay all of them deal with the topic alienation whereas this one tells us that it is only there on page 39 this again tells us on both these pages 46 and 47 talks about relation this is one page and so on but this is a lot of a book which is probably 110 120 pages to have so many pages talk about this thing tells us that this is one of the keywords this is the logic of reading an index before reading a book when I will go through all of these, I will get to know the most important terms and names of this book. What more can you ask for? Okay. Something amazing is going to happen by the time we are done with this preview. Okay. So stay with me. Um, okay. Now, since alienation has anyway aroused our curiosity so much, I think it makes sense. I will just bookmark this page, hang on guys. Absolutely. So, so it makes sense that we figure out what it is. Just out of curiosity, just to you know, figure out what the hell this is about. And so, which one to go to? Well, this is where to go to because this is, uh, because, it, because what may happen here or here is that the word will be mentioned. Assuming we know the meaning, but here, the word will be introduced or something on those lines. This is most likely going to be the case. Not, these are not written in stone, but it is most likely. So let's go to page number 18. As I said, it is going to be very easy in a physical book, but fine, we'll do it. So page number 18. Okay, now listen, I'm trying to go to page number 18 and what is happening is suddenly I'm coming across pictures. Well, go ahead and read the, you know, the blurb of the picture. What is it about? If you want, but you should, not for all, but a few. The exterior of 41 Maitland Park Road, Haverstock Hill, London, where Mark spent the last 15 years of his life. Oh, so we know one thing that Mark spent the last years of his life in England and Marx being a German. Mm, okay, that's interesting. Assuming you didn't know. So, so this has told us something nice. Okay, all right. This is what? Marx with his eldest daughter Jenny in 1870. Okay, so this is Marx with his daughter. So he had children also, which is probably obvious, but not so obvious. Okay, so we have to go to page number 18. Okay, here we come. Now what we have to do is, on this page, we have to find that word, alienation or something related to that. And so try finding it, try finding it. Okay, here I come across this word. So I would rather read this paragraph, isn't it? It makes sense that I read this paragraph. So cool, I'll do that. This is only one short section of the phenomenology. Now, you might say, what the hell is this? Well, you may not know this, but this is a clue here. There are two clues here. One is this word, the, something has already been mentioned. And the other clue is that this word is written in italics. When the font is tilted. And usually, when you say the and something in italics, usually it's a title. Okay, so which means it's a title of some work. So it's enough for the time being. We know we will be told what this is. So we know this. So this is, this is only one short section of the phenomenology. The whole of which traces, so something has been mentioned earlier, which is just a short section. The, however, the whole of which traces the development of mind written in capital letters, so pay attention, 
traces the development of mind as it overcomes contradiction or opposition. Okay, so this work phenomenology in its entirety, the whole, what does it do? It traces the development of mind as it overcomes contradiction or opposition, which is, so these two words are used interchangeably. Mind is inherently universal, meaning it is universal for everybody. But, but guys, RC classes, but in its limited form, this is the opposite of universal, so obviously but, but in its limited form, as the minds of particular people, so universal is mind of everybody, particular people, the opposite of universal, it is not aware of its universal nature. So when you look at it from the point of view of particular people, it is not, it is mind, not aware of its universal nature, that it is universal. That is, so now it is explained further, particular people do not, and you know, it will be, things will be explained further in this book because it's an introductory book. And Peter Singer has already said, you know, this is a book for a beginner. So that's the deal. So you may not have understood this part, even after my explaining, but he himself is doing it. That is, Particular people do not see themselves as all part of the one universal mind. So this is the distinction between universal versus particular with respect to mind. That when it comes to mind, the universal is all of us. Whereas when I look at me versus you and so on, it is particular. That is particular people do not see themselves as all part of the one universal mind. Hegel, Maybe you have forgotten, maybe not, but just in case you have, you may think of Hegelian was there, probably the title of the second chapter. Oh, so Hegelian is the adjective of Hegel. And when you're saying Hegel describes, it's probably a person, most probably, but anyway, Hegel describes this as a, and what is this? Un universal versus uh, particular, as a situation in which mind is alienated from itself. Oh, so now, and remember this, that is, is coming, but ignore, right now ignore it. So what is happening is we can guess the meaning of alienated. We become alienated when we forget our universal nature and keep thinking of me, 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 I, me, myself. Probably that is what it means. So let's confirm it or disconfirm it as the case may be. That is people who are manifestations of mind. Of course, people are manifestations of mind. Manifestation is roughly speaking a, um, an 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 example of something, very rough uh, meaning of this word. Uh, it, it comes from show, something it shows. Uh, so uh, people, that is people who are shows, they show it, who are manifestations of mind, take other people who are also manifestations of mind as something foreign, hostile and external to themselves. Whereas, this is like, but they are, in fact, all part of the same group, great whole. This is the meaning of this word. And what, what we had predicted, which has turned out to be true, that we become alienated when we forget our universal nature, that we are all come from this universal mind and we get into our own things. Hmm, that's interesting. And, and it seems Marx wrote a lot about alienation, okay. If you want, out of pure curiosity, you can read a couple of sentences more or maybe the next full para. Mind cannot be free in an alienated state, which is obvious, at least from their point of view. For, this is reason, in such a state, it appears to encounter opposition and barriers to its own complete development. That is why alienation. So we have understood it. Cool. So let's, meaning we have, partly understood, briefly understood, whatever. Then let's, uh, uh, sorry, uh, let's go to the index again. So we know alienation is an important term. Then this is their power uh, and, and, sorry. When 
such a thing is there a term a name with a comma and then name then this is the last name and this is the first name okay so keep so which means this person's name is bruno bauer and so uh, bruno bauer has come often fine capital it is not surprising at all and compare capital with alienation capital has come far more which is not surprising marx was uh, he wrote about capital capitalism and all that he was a biggest anti capitalism whatever and then capitalism capitalism is not surprising at all and uh, the, the, here the thing is that most of you would know about capitalism and capital and so on probably so we can ignore this then communist communism of course not surprising that so much is there uh, so remember we we are figuring out the keywords some of them are not surprising some of them are surprising communist manifesto see this italics so it's the title of his uh, as i said his book and then this has more then we come to the next economic and philosophical man, philosophic manuscripts if you don't know what manuscripts are things written by hand you know uh, on on particular topics so it may be is one of the works of marx so a lot of things on that economics economist not surprising that so much is talked about engel so much is talked about most of you probably will not be surprised because marx's name is taken along with engel so marx and engels that is what is so karl marx and i think friedrich engels so these were the two they were friends very good friends in fact uh, marx lived on engels's money uh, so uh, so obviously engels would be there fauerbach is there so pretty much then germany is there german ideology is quite a bit hegel and comma gwf which means these are the initials uh, of hegel so hegel is most probably a person uh, and hegel seems to be extremely important and this is the second i think time that we are coming across or third time yeah hegelian hegel in the last thing we read and now hegel and hegel seems to be very important again you can do the same thing you can try figuring out who hegel was or what did he say and so on so again from this and this which one should we go to i think we should go here 16th page okay so we can we can try and you should do these things guys okay you should uh, figure out uh, you should go to these things so let's go to page number 16 and that is the uh, okay that takes us to the chapter only so remember that thing aroused your curiosity the young hegelian uh, so let's just read the first para little more than a year after his arrival as a student in berlin marx wrote to his father that he was now attaching himself ever more closely to the current philosophy the philosophy which was in fashion this current philosophy was the philosophy of g w f hegel okay that's why hegel is important because it seems marx initially became his follower or he really liked who had taught at the university of berlin from 1818 until his death in 1831 so he taught hegel taught at berlin university years later frederick Eng engels this is marx's friend described hegel's influence in the period when he and marx began to form their idea so uh what was his influence hegel so probably we should read about it the hegelian system covered an incomparably greater domain than any earlier system oh okay that's saying a lot and developed in this domain a wealth of thought which is astounding meaning very surprising even today okay this is how influential so we can ignore this and let's read the last of this second chapter and we come across a picture and this is hegel my god he looks scary whose philosophy provided the framework of marx's ideas <laughs> okay they provided the framework so so think about it now again how a picture has helped us his philosophy provided the framework for marx's ideas you know the structure okay okay so here is the last so the young hegelians young hegelians the people who follow hegel thought hegel's philosophy both 
mystifyingly presented and incomplete. Oh, this is a slightly negative term. So it was mystifying, meaning it was difficult to understand and so on. But they thought it was incomplete. So pay it. So, so see what this is doing to us, this preview. We figured that Marx's philosophy is based, sorry, on Hegel's. However, Marx went ahead. He didn't stick with Hegel. When rewritten in terms of the real world instead of the mysterious world of the mind, it made sense. So even though it was mysterious, mystifying. However, if you look at it from the point of view of the real world instead of the material world, Hegel's philosophy made sense. Mind was read as human self-consciousness. That was the meaning of mind as used by Hegel. Or rather, Hegel used the word mind, but Marx and Engels read that as human consciousness. The goal of history, remember this was probably related to a title of a chapter. Anyway, the goal of history became the liberation of humanity. Okay, but so this has to come and this but has to come because of this word incomplete. Yes, we shall. Of course, the chapters will be because the topic because it's about one thing. No, nonfiction book will all, almost always be about one thing. So, of course, the chapters will be interrelated. So, okay, we come to but, but this could not be achieved until the religious illusion had been overcome. So, it seems Hegel didn't do that. Hegel probably had religion or whatever. But according to Marx and maybe Engels also, this had to happen. So, they moved ahead of Engel, or oh, sorry, Hegel. They moved, they learned from him, but then they went their own way. Of course, which is why Marx is so, you know, great for, for all the negatives spoken about him. He, he's still so great because, of course, he can't be a follower and be great. No, he has to invent his own system. So, but this could not be achieved until religious illusion had been overcome. And what happens, guys, is that, Okay. <clears throat> okay, so usually what happens is, not usually, quite often what happens is how a chapter ends, no? So it obviously summarizes or concludes the chapter, but quite often it introduces the next chapter, meaning it not introduces, it gives us a clue as to what is going to follow. And so what we know. Because see, nothing about this has been mentioned, that uh, this could not be achieved until religious illusion has been overcome. Okay, so what about it? Of course, that is what is going to be the next chapter. And so, out of pure curiosity, like someone like me would do that, we should start with the next chapter, meaning not read it, do the same thing, preview. And this, with, this does two things. Remember, I had thought I will come back to this just to figure out what is God about money. But th this itself has done, this one has helped me reach here anyway. But I would have come here anyway. So from God to money, what is the meaning of God to money? So let's start. The transformation of Hegel's method into a weapon against religion was carried through the transformation of Hegel's method. And this transformation is by Marx and Engels guys. Okay. So the transformation into a weapon against religion was carried through most thoroughly by another radical Hegelian, Ludwig Fauerbach. And if you remember from the index, Fauerbach had a lot of references. So Fauerbach is probably important. Oh, so it wasn't Marx first who took Hegel's method and made it anti-religious. It was Fauerbach. So let's read. That's interesting. Friedrich Engels later wrote of the impact of the work that made Fauerbach famous. So why is it that Fauerbach became famous? Then came Fauerbach's Essence of Christianity. One, so essentially, see, this is in italics, meaning it was his book or work or whatever. One must himself have experienced the liberating effect of this book to get an idea of it. So according to Engels, you have to read this book to understand how impactful it was. Enthusiasm was general. Everybody was enthusiastic. We all became at once Fauerbachians, meaning, you know, his followers. Like Bauer, now this is some other person, I, I think we came across him in the index. Fauer Bach in the essence of Christianity characterized religion as a form of alienation. 
and alienation now we know alienation roughly at least we know quite a bit about it and so according to Faubach religion is one of the causes of alienation hmm, that's interesting God he wrote is to be understood remember the title of this chapter from God to money so meaning God will become less important money will become more important in their theory and this is what is happening God is becoming less important God he wrote is to be understood as the essence of the human species okay God is to be understood as the essence of human species externalized and projected into an alien reality since the reality is alien we bring in God into the picture wisdom love benevolence these are really attributes of the human species but we attribute them in a purified form to God okay so basically what what the, uh, Fauerbach did is to show that whatever is good about us, wisdom, uh, love, benevolence, in, in a more purified form, we say that God is this. God is the one with absolute wisdom. God is the one with absolute love. God is extremely benevolent and so on. So these are actually human attributes, meaning traits, and we give them to God. The more we enrich our concept of God in this way, however, the more we impoverish ourselves, meaning the more we become poor, the more we give God these attributes, the poorer we become. The solution is to realize that theology, theology is a study of God or, you know, God related things. So the solution is to realize that the theology is a kind of misdescribed, misdescribed anthropology. Oh, so God related study or whatever thing, science, whatever you want to call it, is actually misdescribed anthropology. So it actually should be the study of humans, but it has become the study of God. So another way of looking at it is, if you look at theology properly, you will understand about humans. What we believe of God is really true of ourselves. This is the meaning of this sentence, guys. This is this sentence's meaning is this. What we believe of God is really true of ourselves. Thus, humanity can regain its essence, which in religion it has lost. So if you get rid of God, if we get rid of religion, humanity will regain its essence. So that is the meaning of from God. Money hasn't come, but whatever. Then we go to the last uh, of this chapter. Before we follow this development, now what uh, they, uh, we are uh, probably uh, is taking a lot of time and you may be getting bored also. So I won't do this, but I would have read the earlier paragraphs just to get a hang of what does this mean. So before we follow this development, however, so there was some development mentioned earlier. So, so but, but before we follow that, we must pause to note the emergence of another key element in Marx's work, which like economics, was to remain central to his thought and activity. Oh, so we know that the next chapter is going to be about that, about this particular, what has been mentioned. And that is going to be about proletariat and so on. Okay, so, so this we have done. And then, now guys, you don't have to do this with all the words, but just the words which arouse your curiosity, the words which seem central and you don't know much about them and so on, okay? And so you go and you do the same with other things. Uh, now here seems to be a lot of reference, but it is not surprising. It is Marx. So since the book is about Marx, obviously so much will be about Marx. And with respect to Marx, this seems to be very important. Uh, so whenever such a thing happens in index, so this, let me teach you this. I think I'll have to teach you through this only. Yeah, so what happens in index sometimes is there is a term like this and then, sorry. What happened? Yeah, so there is a term and then there is a tab, like when you press the tab key of uh, Microsoft Word, uh, as in in Microsoft Word. So there is a tab here, which is a little ahead. What that means is, 
everything which is going to be here now is going to be with respect to this term okay so let me give you another example uh, so for example here philosophy and philosophers so this is about philosophy and philosophy but then suddenly of history so related to this philosophy of history revolution so this is revolution this is french revolution this is industrial revolution so this is this is what this means so with respect to marx the first one is birth and parentage of marx which is on page number 3 and communism meaning you put the first word here marx and communism this will be here death of wife of marx and so on so communism is important economic obviously important freedom oh freedom is very important which is if you know a little bit of marx you will know he his only his basic deal was freedom okay and so on and then you do this with the rest of the words and then you can come back to the title uh, sorry the table of contents and then you do probably with one or two chapters if they have allowed you to we automatically did it but sometimes it may not happen because of those index words so you will have to do this that maybe one chapter or two chapters which are allows you to curiosity you go and read the first and last paragraphs okay and then the last thing what you have to do is you randomly browse the book okay so you randomly browse so you just turn the pages you know like so this picture we have already done it but you may want to read what this is about okay and then uh here suddenly you're browsing and you see that uh, there is a different font here and again it is tabbed uh, and it is uh, in bold so it is probably a quotation you may want to read the quotation you, okay so for, uh, this quotation says as philosophy finds its material weapons in the proletariat the proletariat finds its intellectual weapons in philosophy <clears throat> okay for this you have to know proletariat so let's ignore this then again we are browsing again there is a quotation oh this is another picture who is this this is fauerbach okay fauerbach was mentioned you know we just read about him so this is fauerbach and so on now in 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 some other books what may happen is like for example this book which we were reading oops there is nothing in this to browse here also here also nothing but sometimes in some books what may happen is you may come across some uh, some figures some graphs or something you know okay here it is so so for example i come across this figure okay now this figure may or may not arouse my curiosity so i would want to read about this figure what is it about what it is saying and so on so on and off you know so basically this this part is called browsing a book browsing a book randomly randomly and like a bird whatever peaks your curiosity or peaks your interest meaning you know which makes you interested or makes you curious you dip in there like a bird you dip in on and off you read a sentence or two you read a para or two whatever wherever you think uh, something probably uh, nice or interesting is there you do that and that's it this is previewing a book now we have previewed this uh, i was doing it for you and so i was explaining everything remember this process that i just did shouldn't take more than 10 maximum 15 minutes it can even take 5 minutes okay all this that i did it is just that i was reading everything i was doing it for you that it took so much time but it should take 
ideally you shouldn't spend more than 5 to 10 minutes on this process so so it, it is not as if anything which makes you curious you start reading it no no you should only do it for four five things including the chapter headings and you know whatever you want to so five to seven minutes you should give to this process and after doing this after doing all these things i'll revise it you ask yourself what have i gained and think about it guys don't you think we have gotten so much what this book is about we have we uh, we have understood a little bit about marx where he got his ideas from hegel fauerbach what was his ideas about you know we figured about alienation uh, if i was doing it on my own i would have read about proletariat a little bit all in 7 minutes flat and think so much you already know you haven't read the book at all you know so Uh, it's a beautiful thing to do and in a bookstore uh, what it can lead to is in a in a bookstore uh, it can even um make you choose or not choose a book you can uh, you can choose no no i don't think it is interesting i don't want to buy it or um yeah man i i think it it makes sense i i like it i think i would want to read it and so on you know and, and that is how you decide if you run at your friend's place you see a book non fiction book you want to see what this is about and so on do this okay so this is one you can choose to buy or not buy a book based on but a lot of times if that first question what do i want from this book why do i want to read it if that question is clear in your head if the answer to that question is clear then after doing what we just now did you may find the answer to that only in preview and guys don't feel guilty in then thinking yeah fine my work is done this is what i wanted out of this book see remember and this applies to reading uh, previewing an article also okay there are two reasons for reading something meaning one of the two reasons one is information i want information and the second is knowledge i want knowledge these are two different things okay if you read for information then as long as you get that information the method is irrelevant and the amount is irrelevant the moment you get that information your work is done you are done so whether it is an article if you if you know what you want out of that article and if previewing and browsing tells you that your work is done it's not an ego game here and you're not supposed to impress anybody in fact you will be able to impress purely based on preview similarly if you had a decent idea what you want out of a book and the previewing a book told you that well move ahead that is information the second is knowledge now that's a completely different goal with respect to an article or a book and with respect to life that's a totally different goal and so if knowledge is what you want again there are times when you when you preview a book you can figure out i don't think the knowledge that i want this book is going to give me that because as far as, far as the preview goes mm -hmm, doesn't make sense or yeah i think i should read this and so on that's how so guys that's how you're supposed to do it Okay, so for Sajmal and for everybody, I will I will revise this. Sajmal, anyway, I'll leave a recording also. Uh, first thing, why do I want to read this book? What is it that I want out of this book? Okay, but before that, the browsing technique, meaning I. come across a book i like the title or whatever uh, and i like the picture or whatever and then i read what the book is about after reading what the book is about uh, roughly i want to know hmm if i want to read what do i want out of this book okay this is this is what I'm, okay fine second step i go to the introduction or preface whichever is available in the book here i do that i read that that will give me a summary or the main idea of the book what is the author trying to do in this book cool i understood then i go to the table of contents table of contents will tell me how is the book structured how is the book divided what are the main headings 
what is the title of each chapter which means what is each chapter about which means what is the book about in parts how is it uh, structured then we go, and from here you can do one of the two things either you go to the index straight away or you out of curiosity go to one or two chapters and read the first and last and figure out what those chapters are about and what do they mean and or you go to the index you figure out the most important words the keywords and with again two three of them not more the most important ones which see and most important is obvious because of uh, uh, the number of references so most important is with respect to two things one is for you uh, so do you want to know this and second is with respect to the book and with respect to the book it is damn easy number of references and so with two three of these you go back and read about them a little bit and the last is random dipping in the book randomly you browse see the pictures uh, read about them figures stats something is in different font uh, something is in um, a different uh, tab you know figure out that's that's what you're supposed to do and uh, it will be amazing whether you or not you read the book it will be amazing you don't read you have figured out quite a bit you read you will end up reading the book in a far better way why because you know what the book is about so you're not shooting in the dark now it's the same with rc passage so this is just as i said in the beginning this is just a um, extended version of what we did in the rc class okay guys thanks a lot yes shubh yeah uh, and and here's the best part about these uh, very short introduction books which i will again show you with the help of the screen share One second. Really, what is it doing? Oh, that's what. Again? Is it an incomplete? Where have those pages gone? Oh. I can't find those pages. Oh no, I can. Okay, what happens in these books is this page every every very short introduction and i showed it to you last time guys if you remember if you don't uh, i'll show it to you again i have uh, many of these books uh, this is this is not my full sample there are these many okay so every very short introduction book has a further reading section which is the beauty they introduce you to a topic or a person and then they say what you should now go to okay so for example this is peter singer's recommendation marx wrote so much that the definitive edition definitive is final word on something uh, so that is definitive don't confuse it with definite there is a two different word uh, marx wrote so much that the definitive edition of all the writings of marx and engels meaning the final Word now in the process of publication in East Germany will take twenty five years and a hundred volumes to complete. Oh my God, that's a lot. Anyway, a more modest English collection of collected works, italics began. Whatever, whatever, whatever. Okay, uh, then uh, second para. There are many editions of Marx's most famous works, so he's going to tell us which editions are the best. Because remember, they are translations. Then so so th this is writings by Marx. Bye. 
So we can predict the next is going to be about him. So yeah, about Marx. So for example, second para here for books on Marx's life, go to this, go to this, go to this and so on. On Marx's thought, uh, Robert Tucker in philosophy and myth and Karl Marx was amongst the first to emphasize the continuity of Marx's ideas, which means similar to Peter Singer and so on. Okay, so so yeah, every short introduction book has this. So, so which means you can move on if you want to know more about that particular topic or thing or whatever. Okay. So there you go, guys. It was a nice session, I think. I was thinking, how will I do? Will it be useful or not? Damn cool. <laughs> Any book recommendations? Uh, I don't know. Uh, somebody was asking me in the, the in the some. Uh, I think well, underrated books. So I don't know about underrated, but I can tell you under. Uh, unknown you know like uh, books uh, which which uh, which everybody should read i think uh, so for example yeah vikrant okay so i'll tell you some okay so i have um, Probably two closest to heroes that I have, uh, two of them. And uh, I'm saying closest to heroes, not heroes, because the people who are my heroes dislike the concept of heroes. And so, you know, according to them, one shouldn't have, which is why like, I'm not. So the two are Bertrand Russell and Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky uh, has either written sign, uh, on language, uh, for which he is known as the Einstein of linguistics, or he has written political stuff, so I don't know how much will it make sense to you, but you should give it a shot, um, Noam Chomsky. Um, so there is a book called Noam, uh, Introducing Chomsky, or Chomsky for Beginners. These are similar books, Introducing Chomsky, Chomsky. You can start from there. I won't recommend his book straight away, so you should start from there. But the second one is Bertrand Russell. You may have heard of his name, one of the greatest uh, philosophers and mathematicians of the 20th century. So, um, and he, uh, his popular books were written for keeping layman in mind, not for, so very nicely written and so on. So this is a wonderful book of his, uh, The Conquest of Happiness. It's a beautiful book. Uh, I think you should read it. Uh, maybe you're too young for this, but maybe you are at the right age to read such a thing like this. And another book of his, you may laugh at the title. And considering you guys are preparing for MBA, you are high flyers, want to, uh, you know, uh, rule the world and whatever. This may sound funny, but but I, I don't know. It is my all-time favorite. It is called In Praise of Idleness, again, by Bertrand Russell. In Praise of Idleness, in which he has... Uh, spoken about uh, how not doing anything or not working is one of the greatest pleasures of life and not working by that working for someone you know and so on so it's complicated it is not as the title implies you should this on idleness i think as an essay is freely available on the internet you can check it out uh, so this has more such things so you don't have to buy this book honestly you can just read um, in praise of idleness as an essay it is freely available on the internet you can give it a shot it's a beautiful essay uh, it is not uh, very long i'll tell you how long it is that that's how long it is just just this much okay so from page number one to page number 16 so of this size 16 sides so in praise of idleness, you should find. So these, uh, so but this, I think the book should be bought. So this is very nice. A uh, few years back, I read this book, uh, The Philosopher and the Wolf. Uh, it is amazing. It is very, very nice, I think. Uh, 
and very similar to how I think, meaning I'm not particularly fond of people for various reasons. And so th th this book is on those lines. So in case you're not that type, maybe you may dislike this book because he has really spoken bad about people, but he has given reasons and it's very hard to argue with them. Uh, for a lighter read, I will recommend in psychology, this is a book called Predictably Irrational. Some of you may have heard of it and some of you may have read it. It's a brilliant book. Uh, it, it is on the fact that uh, we think we are rational human beings, but we aren't uh, so much. We aren't so much rational. So, and uh, it is, uh, so this guy, uh, Dan O'Reilly, is a behavioral psychologist, a behavioral economist. And so it's not random, it's based on research. So it's a very nice book and very light read. So you will like, like it. So this is another interesting book. This is a nice book. It's a slightly thick book, but it's a beautiful book and it's easy read. Um, the Happiness Hypothesis, it's a nice, very nice book. On um, Again, this guy is a positive psychologist. Uh, I don't agree with him uh, in a lot of other things, but this book is brilliant. Um, it is about what uh, what are the things which make us happy, make us content. Uh, this this could be a challenging book. Uh, it, it's called Selfie and See. It looks like a selfie, meaning you can see uh, your reflection in it. That's a design. It's a beautiful design, Selfie. And the subtitle is How We Became So Self-Obsessed and What It's Doing to Us. How We Became So Self-Obsessed and what it's doing to us. So it's a beautiful book, but the problem, uh, like I'm hesitant in recommending this is because it has a lot of history, a lot of history. Uh, and that history um, gripped me, like I loved it. But I recommended it to somebody and someone said, you know, there was a lot of history. And so that person didn't like that part, otherwise that person didn't like the book. So I don't know about you, uh, but, but it's a beautiful book. It is amazing and it is, a nice book to read these times, you know, the selfie time. So basic idea of this book is, um, so I, I'll read the blurb for you, okay? We live in the age of the individual. We are supposed to be slim, prosperous, happy, extroverted, and popular. We are supposed to be slim, prosperous, happy, extroverted, and popular. This is a culture's image of the perfect self. We see this person everywhere in advertising, in the press, all over social media. We are told that to be this person, we just have to follow our dreams, that our potential is limitless, that we are the source of our own success. This is what we are told. But this model of the perfect self can be extremely dangerous. People are suffering under the torture of this impossible fantasy. Unprecedented meaning, something which has not happened before. Unprecedented social pressure is leading to increases in depression and suicide. Where does this ideal come from? See the history part. Where does this ideal come from? Why is it so powerful? Is there any way to break its spell? Meaning to break its magic or not? To answer these questions, Selfie takes us from the shores of ancient Greece history through the Christian Middle Ages to the self-esteem evangelists of 1980s California. The rise of narcissism and the selfie generation and right up to the era of hyper-individualistic neoliberalism in which we live now. It tells the extraordinary story of the person we all know so intimately. It tells the extraordinary story of the person we all know so intimately, ourselves. It's a brilliant book, but guys, it won't be a light read. That I can guarantee. But it is amazing. That book reminds me of this book, one of the finest books I've read recently. Uh, it's called Lost Connections. It's on similar lines. And if you read the subtitle, Uncovering the Real Causes of Depression and the Unexpected Solutions. And so depression, true, the clinical depression, you know, for which people are medicated. So you may feel it is not for you, but I think it is for everybody. I think everybody should read this book, uh, Lost Connections by uh, Yuval, uh, sorry, Johan Hari. 
you you will know Harari is also a similar name. So this is Johan Hari, Lost Connection, beautiful book. Uh, this is uh, an, a light read, so this you can read before this. Uh, similar, but this, is, this tells us the history. This is amazing, but but this is this is beautiful. I think everybody should. Read. But as of now, I think this should be enough. Okay, guys. Happy. Uh, yeah, Murakami is good, Vikrant. Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand is somebody you like um, in your college, you know, when we want to, as I said, rule the world. So, but as you grow up and uh, if you care even a little bit about other people, then Ayn Rand can, can seem to be one of the most, uh, one of the worst people around but that's that's a that's for another day i think but but yeah at, at your age i think ayn rand seems to be seems to be damn cool uh, noam chomsky no he's a linguist was nay he's still alive he's around 88 89 uh, lots of his stuff is there on youtube uh, he doesn't put it others put it he's a linguist he has researched on language and he came up with this concept called generative grammar so basically his idea is that uh, we are born with language uh, it, so it's like it's like we are born with a heart. So according to his theory, we are born with language skills inside, and we just need to refine them when we grow up. Uh, it's not that language is taught to us. We we just shown the way, the guidance, and everything sort of comes back. So that's his basic theory. Okay. All right, sir. Uh, sorry, <laughs> sir. I mean. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much.